Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Waters, and I am a violinist with the Fry Street Quartet. My quartet serves as co-music directors for the Nova Chamber Music Series in Salt Lake City and as quartet in residence at Utah State University. Welcome to this installment of the Crossroads Project podcast. Just recently, my colleagues in the Fry Street Quartet and physicist Dr. Robert Davies premiered the film version of Rising Tide, the Crossroads Project a multidisciplinary performance project addressing issues of global sustainability. To talk a little bit more about this project, I'd like to introduce my co-host and colleague, Rob Davies. Thank you, Robert, uh, very much. And uh, thank you to the Nova Chamber Music Series for hosting us and for hosting this podcast. So uh, as you've heard, I'm Rob Davies. I'm a professor of physics at Utah State University. I focus on something called critical science communication. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but more relevant for today, I am co-creator, as Robert told you, of the Crossroads Project, along with uh, my friends, the Fry Street Quartet, uh, who is well known, of course, to Nova audiences, but perhaps not to all of our listeners. And uh, just to just a plug for them, they are a professional string quartet in residence at uh, Utah State University's Kane College of the Arts and have been so for the last 18 years, uh, if you can believe that. Um, so... Uh, uh, we have really a genuinely fascinating conversation coming up today uh, with our guests, uh, who we'll introduce in a moment. Um, but first, I wanted to give a brief introduction for those of you not familiar with uh, the performance we're discussing today, which, uh, as you've heard, is called the Crossroads Project Rising Tide. So the Crossroads Project is a performance science project on the topic of human sustainability and human vibrancy. And Rising Tide is a performance within that umbrella project uh, that we have just premiered the film of with NOVA, and is specifically a performance weaving together uh, information and imagery and music to look at this intersection between human civilization, uh, the human systems that we have built, things like food and energy and economy to help us thrive, uh, the intersection of that with the earth system that is uh, there to allow us to survive um, and that has made it possible for us to survive. Uh, and we wanted to, uh, to do this performance in a way that doesn't just inform an audience, but really connect audiences to this information. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, now, clearly, this is a pretty big topic, uh, dealing with complex systems, lots of nuance to explore. Uh, and of course, this is the real challenge, uh, is distilling this story uh, of human civilization and earth systems into a 70 minute performance uh, experience. So uh, Nova has invited us to create these podcasts as a way to expand the story, uh, give us a little bit more room to explore these topics uh, in more detail than we can in the performance and also explore the process of telling this story in this way. Uh, and so to do that, we've invited some additional scientific voices to join us, uh, as well as our artistic collaborators. And um, we're going to just introduce those two voices who are joining us today uh, uh, briefly, and then we'll get into our discussion and we'll have them introduce themselves a little more fully. So Robert, who do we got with us? Well, we're we're so happy um, to have uh, the great composer Laura Kaminsky with us, who is also an incredibly dear friend. Laura, welcome to our podcast. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. So, Laura, uh, just very briefly, um, in 2012, when the quartet and Rob was putting together the um, what is kind of the current version of Rising Tide, we had in previous versions. Um, stuck in some music of Beethoven and stuck in some music of Shostakovich and clearly felt that we, we needed some original music uh, for this um, for this podcast. So we uh, contacted Laura um, after looking around and, and finding her music and being really compelled by it. Um, Laura, do you want to talk a little bit about your first introduction to this project and how that struck you? Oh, it was such an exciting day when I opened my email and there was a note from Rebecca McFall, the second violinist of the quartet, saying that she'd heard that I often wrote music in response to social or political concerns, that I'm somewhat of an activist, and that she was developing a project around sustainability and climate change issues 
and they were searching for some music. Um, and so I wrote back immediately and said, I'd be very interested in having this conversation with you and was thrilled to, to get this concept presented of, of a scientific lecture that was amplified and enlightened by visual and musical images and sounds to heighten the experience for the audience member, hopefully with that leading to a more impact, impactful response and possibly a call to action. Um, so that was our very beginning uh, of connection and it's just grown into, as you said, Rob, uh, uh, Robert, uh, just a friendship, a very profound trusting friendship of creative and political engagement together. Thank you, Laura. Well, uh, and we will come back uh, very soon to Laura and expand this conversation. We also have with us um, Dr. Ben Abbott, uh, professor of, um, of ecology at Brigham Young University with us joining us today. And I should say that, uh, so the performance, for those of you who've seen it, you know, or the, uh, the film uh, also, that we've got it broken into these pieces of the earth system and then human systems. And the, and the earth system, we first talk about water, and then we talk about the living bits of the planet, life, the earth's biosphere, and in particular, the, the fundamental rules by which nature has organized successful ecosystems. And then we talk about the very base of the biosphere, uh, the food for everybody else. And, and, um, and then we talk about human systems. And so that's the kind of the, the sequence. And we're going to look a little bit more about that in a minute. But in today's podcast, we're going to focus or start our focus at least on the water section. Uh, and this is the, the one of the several reasons that I uh, immediately wanted to invite uh, Dr. Abbott to uh, to join us because uh, this is this is uh, his specialty his expertise is working with uh, human water systems and so um, I'm sure I haven't quite done that justice so let me first ask Ben why don't you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and and your work thank thank you so much Rob I'm very happy to be here uh, so I am a, a global ecologist and my specialty is global hydrology and my work tries to understand how the, the natural systems of water, land, oceans, climate interact with uh, humankind. And more and more, as we have better understanding of how widespread human activity is uh, and how influential we are on all aspects of the earth system, we see that you no longer can understand water without including humans. So we have to take these two issues together. So I was really moved by the piece and, and I'm excited and honored to be here talking with you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Ben. And, and, um, uh, I should say I follow Ben on Twitter, and for anyone who's interested in these topics, he's a, a great person to follow. So I'm sure if you uh, Google Ben Abbott in Twitter, you'll, you'll come that's up with a, that. That's a dangerous recommendation. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to start uh, the conversation, Ben. I, I just mentioned in the introduction that, of course, one of the reasons for this podcast, the main reason, is to expand the conversation. And, and it's a real challenge to distill these these complex and very interesting uh topics into, into, you know, in the case of the water section of the performance, you know, about six or seven minutes of, of, of dialogue and, um, uh, and, and to figure out how to distill that well. So my first question to you is, how did we do? <laughs> what, what did you think? Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and what, what did you really feel you wanted to expand upon a bit? Um, uh, as yeah, well. that's such a that's such a good question because in any of these issues, not we can't address the full breadth of the scientific or the human and artistic aspect of these issues. But I really liked the emphasis uh, in this project of that interrelation, uh, the dependency of humans on water. So sometimes when we think of environmental issues, it can be framed in terms of we need to save the earth. It's somehow altruistic. And we really know that it's exactly the opposite. We would have no human life. We'd have no life at all without these natural cycles. We sometimes call them ecosystem services. And then from a more um, personal and, and indigenous view, they're often called gifts of the earth. And I, I, I really like that phrasing. So I thought that the first, the observation that all life directly depends on water, and then also that climate 
depends on water. So we are, of course, modifying um, some of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The effect of those gases is amplified because of these physical feedbacks with water. So I, I thought that that was a, an excellent um, an excellent emphasis of the piece. One of the really important um, issues that we're dealing with water that wasn't as apparent is that water pollution still is this global issue. Uh, 1.8 million people die each year from waterborne pathogens. Um, and many of these issues, including emerging pollutants, things that novel chemicals that we've created, pharmaceuticals that we give primarily to livestock, those are polluting the water, the surface water, the groundwater, and we even can find traces of these far out in the middle of the ocean. So that's another example of how when we have a negative interaction with the natural world, it very quickly comes back and affects our well being. So we need to take care of the earth from a self interest perspective, and then also because I believe it will lead us to, to greater happiness and, and meaning. Wow, that's that's really well put. Um, and if, so the pollution, I think, is a, is a fabulous uh, point to, to bring out. And of course, there's some imagery uh, that we present at the end of this movement that, that shows some polluted water. I, I focus on, in particular, heavy metals and uh, oil. Uh, but of course, no real data. This is a piece where you're saying, oh, that looks like, that seems like it should be bad. But this number that you've given us, uh, you know, 1.8 million people a year die. And of course, they don't die from water pollution. That's not the way we we hear about it. What we hear about is they've died from some disease, a, a cancer, a, a heart disease, a, a nerve condition, something like that. But of course, that is, uh, you can be traced back to these things, but we never hear about that. That's right. We don't hear and about it that often. That's one of the key things. So many of these environmental issues are invisible. You don't see the cause and effect uh, immediately in the same place or at the same time. So very rarely will it say on the death certificate, this person died of water pollution. However, when we look back and see what led to the condition that they had or the acute uh, disease that they contracted, it was absolutely associated with our interaction uh, with water. However, as you point out, some of these things we can see, right? You can see an oil slick or you can see an algal bloom that's caused by excess nutrients that we put into, into the water, either from our wastewater or from our agriculture. Those things are visible. Now the, the challenge is, how can we understand these scientific numbers that can sometimes feel faceless and um, uh, sterilized? How can we humanize that? And that's where this collaboration, I think, is so interesting, because not only does it present the data and the information, but it gives you a chance through the artistic interpretation to feel what it means. Because simply saying 1.8 million people, at least for me, is, is really hard to understand. But when you can look at those images, when you can hear the, the, the music, which isn't isn't literal, it's very uh, emotive and interpretive, that gives a, a, a crucial complement to these numbers that we now know because of, of global science. Well, that's, uh, that's a perfect, I think, segue to, to take us uh, over to the other side, the artistic uh, presentation of this. Uh, what do you think, Robert? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I know all of us in the quartet loved so much about Laura's um, four movement piece, but particularly the water movement, is that it does such an amazing job of highlighting uh, in, in a, perhaps in an abstract and more emotional way, some of the things that, that Rob talks about in the water um, a speech that he gives, which are on the one hand, kind of the, the wonder of water and the sort of the electricity and the sparks that you get kind of midway through the movement. But at the beginning, there's, there's a sense of real foreboding um, and 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 darkness to um, to that, and I wondered, Laura, if you could talk a little bit about how you decided to take that this notion of of water into your um, in, into your process. I think early on in our conversations about the structure of the piece, um, Rob talked about water as being the source of life, and that really struck me that everything comes from there. And so I wanted the piece to come out of the depths in a way. And I had recently been in Armenia in uh, Yerevan and seen the big lake Sevan and thinking about this ancient culture and the, the sense of the water sustaining for thousands of years, this evolution of, of this culture 
and the landscape and the, and the, the whole environment in which this water fed early civilization and life as we know it. So I, I kind of turned to early Armenian chant as a kind of percolating from the depths of the earth and the depths of our soul. And that's sort of the darkness I think that you're referring to Rob, but it starts to flow. It starts to break out and to flow. And that's the movement and the, the joy and the life and the light sparkling on the water as it flows and gives life. So those are the different kinds of visual images that were percolating in response to what I thought Rob's lecture was going to comprise of. And then the music just starts to take on its own life. And as I went into the movement of water, I was thinking of the different kinds of energies that would be captured by changing how the music flowed. So that's kind of how it got written. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, this might be a good time to, to uh, throw up the graph that you were <laughs> handed at the very beginning of this process. When uh, Rob, you want to talk a little bit about this? So, well, of course, uh, I'm a physicist. Uh, <laughs> if, we, if you can take something and plot it on a graph, you, you know we're going to do it. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I sat down to try to figure out a, a structure for this this performance, um, you know, there's there's lots of things to consider. There's well, the two main things. That, well, so what's the information that we want to present? Uh, how long is it going to take? And also, uh, you know, I, early on, someone said, you know, you really need to consider the emotional arc that you want the audience to follow. And so I'll I'll briefly explain this graph. Starting on the left at the bottom. Um, you've got these chunks of squares. There's kind of a black one and then a blue one and then a gold one. Those are the different bits. The, the first one on the left is the prologue that kind of introduces us. The next one is, is where we're at right now, this water movement, that blue one. And you see the blue one has a kind of a little white line through it. So that delineates uh, the first part of the blue one moving from left to right is, is me speaking and showing some imagery. And then the second part of the blue and after that little white line, that divider is the music. And so I was trying to just divide this up and say, okay, it can be roughly half speaking and then roughly half music. And this is a good point to, to mention to the audience that uh, deliberately the idea was for, for them to be presented with some information in that first part of the blue square, uh, have that information amplified by some, some compelling imagery, which I show along with it. And we'll look at a clip in a moment so you get a sense of that. And then have the music form a, a contemplative space for the audience to just sit with the information that they had. Uh, and so that's what that graph is. And I'll take you one more up. If you go above that first line to the second, the, 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 the upper line of chunks there, and you see those little, um, the black lines that start at the bottom and then jump up that was me trying to just think of the emotional arc of the of the audience. And I think I've got that flipped. The idea with water was that we talk about interesting things that are kind of fun and interesting, and that's an emotional high. And then I end the talk with just a little bit of foreboding, uh, which you'll see in the clip in a moment. And then the music comes in. Um, and and that's the conversation that, that I had with uh, Laura was kind of what I was looking for in the emotional arc and what the information was going to be. And of course we did that for the remaining vignettes as well. And so that's what Laura was presented with. Uh, and, and you, and you started with, what did you think when you got this graph, Laura? I thought it was beautiful. Um, <laughs> or do you I, even remember it? I'm not sure. I, 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 when you said you were going to put up the graph, it's like, okay, what graph is that? But now that I see it, of course, I remember that, that you had come up with that. I think what, I saw when you shared that. And of course we met in conversation with the whole quartet and we we already knew that there was going to be uh, scientific data and charts and numbers and facts and figures. And then moving from that, that each section of the piece, and this is what I took away from understanding your graph. And as we developed the structure for the whole that it had to have a through line narrative and each section had to have its own through line narrative within the bigger arc of the piece. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the things that I loved right at the beginning was that you said, I need four movements of a string quartet, which is great because so many of the classical standard repertoire string quartets are in four movements. So in a way that already presented me with a structure for the music before I even knew what your talk was going to be. And there's a kind of a plan in most quartets that the first movement is sort of presentational and strong and has some strong ideas and the, the second movement can be slower and more inward looking and the third is often a dance music type of movement and then the fourth is grand and culminates everything and so I had that in mind and it actually fit with what your content was going to be but one of the things that I think evolved early for all of us was the notion that each segment needed its own pride of place that the images weren't merely there to make Rob look pretty or to be background for the quartet, but that the images had their own narrative and that the music, while it supported some of the images during the transitional moments coming out of talking to imagery to music, that the music had to have its own place and wasn't background to a movie. And so the, the respect for all of the segments to make a cohesive whole was an important part of the original. And I think that's a little bit what I got from that first chart that you hmm. shared with me. Yeah, that's that's well put. We definitely did not want the music to be any kind of a score. We wanted it to have its really own voice in telling the story. Um, yeah. I'm guessing that's the first time that the first and last time you've ever gotten a graph as part of a commission. Maybe so. And, and and in fact, I I've now spent the last number of years writing a number of operas. And in a way, that graph is similar to how I approach writing an opera because the libretto is the narrative. And each of the scenes have their own arc. And then they have to all add up to each other and they relate to each other. So I actually make color coded charts now when I receive my libretto. And I guess, Rob, you have more influence on the creative musical process than you know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's actually informed how I create big, big pieces now that are, you know, an hour to two hours long. Wow. So thank um, you. Well, thank you. It's just been an amazing piece of music. I think we all agree. Um, Robert, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if maybe this is a good time for us to, uh, to, we have a short clip that maybe helps people, if you haven't seen the film or our performance, just get a sense of how these things are, are melded together and blended together in the performance. Should we show that? Yeah, I think it's great. Before, before we do, oh. could I just jump in and ask Robert, if you wouldn't mind just saying a little bit about when we first started working together and I brought sketches and it wasn't done and we mm -hmm. sat and workshopped the piece, what that process was like, because I think that's a, a sort of close up of what the whole building of the entire Crossroads Project performance is, but this is just sort of the pure musical sub section. And it well, was I think, I mean, it was an amazing, um moment that afternoon, our, our first working together, it's always a, an, an exciting uh, moment to to crack open a brand new piece of music, especially with the composer right there. And this was no exception, but this was a particularly um, unusual project. I mean, I think all of us in the room, you've certainly written plenty of music for uh, performers and and all four of us in the quartet have, have premiered and learned new brand new works. But in the context of creating this performance piece, um, which has so many moving parts and is, is kind of an ambitious agenda to it, um, we really had no idea what we were in for. It was it was uh, it was daunting. Uh, uh, I mean, we clearly knew that we didn't want Beethoven or Shostakovich, but what it was that we wanted or were going to get was was just so incredibly mysterious. And so digging into the into the music that you had written and the and the um, the the sketches that you had written and then even more so kind of the process of working with you get asking you questions about what you had in mind in a particular spot and then trying out different things that's always one of the most amazing things for us as as classical music performers who often do a lot of performing with um people who are no longer with us sometimes you know centuries ago these pieces come from 
it'd be really great to be able to call up Beethoven on the phone and say, what did you mean by this marking? But we can't do that. So not only asking questions, but even trying, well, what if we, if, if the goal is this, then what if we actually alter what you've written just a tiny bit to kind of turn a corner in a, in a different way? Uh, and that was maybe the most exciting part of the process, which has always been there. Um, I know between our quartet and you, Laura, is is this this feeling of um, co-birthing a, a new work of art, which was which was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was that this sense of collaborative um, shared creativity, and and it's an interdependent ecosystem, which isn't complete until there's an audience. Yeah. That makes it whole. Yeah, let's um let's hear that let's see that clip. Great. Get a little more context. Once assembled and sustained, living structure made animate. In water, simple life begins, and in water, complex life evolves. This then, chemistry and climate, we know is why all life needs water. Thank goodness there's so much of it. Uh uh, not so fast. Water seems plentiful on the water planet, but only a trickle flows fresh, and just a trickle of that flows within our grasp. And when all the drops are counted, when all accounting concludes, just one drop in 10,000 is ours to sip. And so this too, we know about water, that it is precious. And we know a little more. You see, from water purity to water supply, all is not well with humanity's water. Gets me every time. So for so for anyone who's interested in um, seeing a little bit more of that, uh, you can find this uh, on the Nova uh, Salt Lake City um, Nova website at uh, www.novaslc.org slash crossroads. And you, that'll take you directly to the full film, which is about a little over 70 minutes of um, more of what you just saw. I no, actually I think I've heard. Question. Sorry, I, I got a, a quick question for Ben. Um, I, Rob is one of the few scientists that I've, uh, you know, really talked with in depth about uh, his work and and particularly his work in in communicating the the findings of science to the public. And I'm curious. And he's often said that in in talking with with um, people in the public that he can he feels like they can understand certain aspects of the science. He can lead them through it really well, but um, but making them kind of take it any any deeper is a little bit of of the um, of the challenge. And so I'm wondering if you've encountered that too, and what sorts of avenues you're you're um, you you've kind of gone through in order to overcome that. Yeah, th thank you for that question, Robert. W one model of making science accessible is to to dumb it down, right? And I, I hate that language, first of all. It feels really condescending. 
and I, I like what the way that Rob phrased it, which is to try to distill the science down. And, and in reality, to make science accessible and to get those crucial ideas across requires a deeper understanding of the subject matter so that you're not removing some of those crucial components that make it understandable. But I find that people are incredibly interested in science. They want to know this. Uh, it's a part of our uh, the, the reason why we as a species have been so successful, we're, we're curious. And what we know from uh, science communication and also psychology is that there has to be a relationship there. It's not enough. I mean, the, all the science in the world is available on the internet. It's in textbooks that you can find, but most of us aren't accessing it. The times that we're learning things are when there's some kind of relationship, there's some kind of interest that's been piqued. And so projects like this that are uh, transdisciplinary, that are bringing people together around different, um, different areas of interest are really crucial. And then a lot of my work has shifted towards uh, what we call citizen science or participatory science, where um, Typically, if I needed to collect uh, a couple hundred water samples, I would hire some technicians or work with some graduate students to help me do that. And recently in the, in the Utah Lake watershed, we've been collaborating with uh, citizens of Utah Valley who go out and collect these water samples with us. They help us identify the places that they've seen changes in the flow or the quality of that water. And this has ended up being really transformative and it hasn't been a one way exchange. It's not just that I'm giving information to the community. But I have learned about new places. I've learned about springs that I didn't know about, uh, discharges from wastewater treatment plants or factories or agricultural fields. Th that is what we need more of. Um, to, to achieve one of the goals of this project, it, it, I, I was not involved in the creation at all, but I've watched it and was, was very uh, moved by it. And that, that phrase of, we need to believe what we know. It's not, it's not enough just to have the information. We have to believe it and put it into action. And when we are a part of generating that understanding, it, I, I feel that it's incredibly empowering and we also understand it on a different level. So that kind of participatory work that's going to take many different forms depending on what the questions are is really important. Hmm. Um, ben, I'm wondering if, uh, I, I wanna continue on this a little bit, this notion of distilling. Uh, and come at it from a something I was concerned about in writing the script. And, and I know you had a little experience with this. It was really interesting to me when I first heard about it. So of course, the, the, the problem is we as scientists are, are trained really well how to communicate our science with each other uh, and to tell each other everything that's wrong with what we did, all the uncertainty, all the, uh, all the stuff we don't know yet. And of course, that's how science progresses. Um, and, and so, but of course, that's not the way to help the public or policymakers or uh, uh, lay people who aren't experts in that science understand what's important about it and 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 where the where the real critical pieces are in something like say climate change. So so of course we distill it. We can't include every last little detail that we would as scientists. I always worry about uh, getting pushback from scientists. Like oh you've you know you've left this out and you've left that out and you've and that isn't quite. Uh, correct, and I know that um, you I, you you published a paper fairly recently on the global water crisis, uh, and in the process of getting it uh, um, published, uh, so not only are we distilling it, but also if it's important, there are uh, challenges, even dangers. Certainly, climate change to the, rising to the level of an emergency um, associated with it, and. Again, you get this pushback from a scientist saying, well, let's think about this and let's think about that. Um, but I know you published this paper and had an experience of that in the scientific community. And, and uh, tell us about that experience a little bit. Yeah, we last year we had a, a paper come out that was kind of an update on what do we know about water on Earth? Um, what, are, what are the different kinds of human water uses? How is climate change affecting the water cycle? And then how has the uh, land use, so the agriculture, the urbanization, the modifications that we've made to the surfaces of the Earth, and now even the subsurfaces through uh, oil extraction and fracking, how is that altering water? And it, whenever you address a, a big question, you have to go beyond the, the discipline that you're working in. And so necessarily this, uh, the paper spanned out, we looked at science education and visualizations, how are people drawing the water cycle? And we ended up submitting this, I think, to five different journals before it finally got uh, 
um, accepted at, a, at the long story is it got accepted at the very first journal that we submitted to, but we found the right editor who actually invited us to resubmit the paper once they, they, they caught the vision. But there is this, this sense that we can sometimes get in the public of these scientists are, are such, such alarmists. They're always talking about these problems. The world's not that bad. But if you actually look at the track record of science, we, we are biased, but it's in a conservative direction. We tend to not want to call something an emergency or a crisis until there is ample evidence. Um, we're more than 95% sure that it must be uh, the thing that we're saying it is. And so we got pushback of people saying, there's not even a water crisis at all, right? That's kind of alarmist language. And we we had to take some steps back and pitch it to the scientific community and explain, we've disrupted the flows of water through our atmosphere. This, they're called rivers in the sky. So right now, in uh, if you live in Northern India, the monsoonal cycle, the transporting water from the ocean to where you live has been weakened by deforestation in Southern India. Uh, if you live in the in the Midwestern United States, you're actually experiencing more precipitation, 10 to 20 percent more rain than you used to during uh, the growing season because of the groundwater that we're extracting from the Ogallala and then returning to the atmosphere via via transpiration. So there are we have disrupted and restructured water on Earth. Uh, and at the same time, as I mentioned before, uh, nearly 2 million people a year, that's almost one in 10 deaths is associated with the pollution that we're putting into water. So from a human perspective, there's, there's no question here. And eventually we were able to reconcile those different, very skeptical scientific views uh, with that, that human side as well. Um, but it, but it's one of the challenges. There are cultural differences, not only between political parties and um, different cultures and races, but there are cultural differences between um, disciplines and, and and careers. So it, it, th those can be obstacles to making progress. Hmm. It must be so uh, frustrating to not to deal with um, skepticism of that sort, not just in, let's say, a political arena or from industry, but from your own community of scientists. I can only imagine. You know, uh, it can be frustrating, but it also, thankfully, you have these amazing relationships, right, of people that you're working with, and you're not going through it alone. If you look at the number of, of authors on, a, on an average paper in science, that has been growing more and more and more. And that's not just, oh, hey, you're my friend, I'll put you on your paper, on my paper. But as science has grown, as, and as the breadth of our knowledge has grown, you have to have experts from different fields with different um, suites of expertise collaborate together. So that's, that's really the wonderful and uplifting part of science. Ben, may I ask, because that's the collaborative that you're speaking about. And like with the Crossroads Project, it really was birthed in Rob Davies's mind that as a scientist giving talks about this subject matter, he wanted to reach people in a different way that went beyond just the purely intellectual, but to the deeply emotional so that it might spark new ways of being and thinking. But to me, and maybe, maybe Robert Waters, you may disagree, but even though I'm a composer, so my job is to work with my quartet, I felt like I was, beholden always to Robert Davies' vision. When you work transdisciplinarily amongst scientists in other disciplines, is it clear who the lead is or might that change as a paper starts to reveal different information or a different way of thinking about all the information that you collectively are bringing together? Because even though Rob Davies was always the god of our project, there were, in fact, moments where each of us with our different secondary supporting roles owned the conversation. Yeah. But in the end, we, we had to find our way to an agreement that worked for Rob. Yeah. How does that work amongst different disciplines in the sciences when you begin to question something and fill in what you need and it goes off? Yeah, I think that it's an analogous but but different in that as scientific discovery moves forward, uh, there there's a dictator, and it's none of the participants who are <laughs> who are trying to discover, but it's the evidence, right? And and so what you find can fundamentally change the direction of your project. For example, with this water cycle paper, 
the methodology that we used is we analyzed 600 uh, diagrams of the water cycle from different disciplines, uh, including high school textbooks, all the way up to the top papers in the top scientific journals. And we really expected the main finding to be that the up arrows, the evapotranspiration wouldn't equal the down arrows. Really, really gripping science, right? For a hydrologist, that was that was exciting. But <laughs> what, all, of, Sorry. all of you are rolling your eyes. <laughs> we, did, we didn't find that. You know, we part of the motivation of the study was a few a few diagrams that we looked at. What we found was eighty five percent of the diagrams showed no humans. It was natural landscapes with no human land use, no individual humans. So it was depictions of a water cycle that no longer exists. Mm. And so there was a discussion in the group of, well, our paper is no longer about evapotranspiration and precipitation. It's about how somehow we've gone down this disciplinary path of focusing on the water and we forgot that we can't understand the water without the people. And, that, and then the whole project changed directions. Right. Um. I want to uh, that I, I want to bring it back Ben to another um, point that prior to the podcast you and I were discussing that you brought up that I thought was great. I think Robert and Laura are going to be very interested in this because this is a a critique that that we had very early uh, in perform. I think it was the second performance. It's the performance Laura and Robert. If you remember, we gave it in Los Angeles, Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Convention Center to about fifteen hundred. Um, uh, sustainability educators. Uh, ben, it's the AISHI conference. Oh, yeah. We gave this uh, American Association of Sustainability and Higher Education, um, and uh, it was your uh, it was your critique, and you were a little bit worried, Ben, about sharing it with me. And I encouraged you to. Do you remember what it was? I, I do. Yeah, because so so far we've talked about two kind of ways of knowing, scientific and, and artistic, but there are of course other ways of knowing. And so one of the really important points that the, this um, film makes is that we have a situation of nonlinear growth where we're very rapidly uh, expanding. Um, the rate of population growth is actually decreasing very rapidly, but what is continuing to skyrocket is consumption. So we're in this cycle of hyper-consumption and uh, the, the, we're generating more and more information, more than we've ever had before. But then there's a, there's a conclusion that's made early on in the film that says, we know more now, the last two centuries have been more important than the 2000 that followed it, talking about the whole arc of human existence. And the thing that right away jumped to my mind was, well, well wait a minute, the, the ways of being the understanding, the relationship with nature that those 2000 generations had before are the only reason why we are here. That wisdom, that cultural understanding, mm -hmm. that indigenous knowledge, that religious belief, those are the ways of knowing have allowed science and art to make such amazing progress in the recent history. And, and so the, the, the way that I see it is, it's not that we need a, a new invention of, we don't need to create a new way of, of understanding and being. We need to rediscover and reconnect with those indigenous ways. Uh, and all of us, whether we come from a Judeo-Christian or Islamic or any other background, if you go back far enough, we have roots in our own cultures that were sustainable, that truly interacted in a, in a reciprocal way with the natural world. So that's why I love the final, I think it's the final one about reimagining I like the re in that, right? That it's it's nothing new, but it's reconnecting to these traditional ways of being that have allowed our species to be so amazingly and astoundingly successful. It's that yeah, the line you're referring to is in the in the in the prologue of the whole performance where I say, um, nearly everything we know about our island planet, we learned in just the last two hundred years, and. Um, and you're not the first one to notice that, you know, well, what about all this indigenous uh, uh, knowledge that, as you perfectly put, has gotten us to where, allowed us to survive this long and, and thrive. Um, and it's it's been a real challenge to, um, because the point of that line was to say, well, we're gonna go forward and we're gonna talk about, here's what we know and we need to believe what we know. And it was noted, noting that science is telling us these things. Um, and the notion of, 
we were going to try to emphasize the science and I, I could never find a way to talk about the indigenous knowledge in a way that didn't sort of take us down a tangent for a little too long. But what you've just said, and this is interesting, you know, we've talked about how the performance gets written and rewritten. <laughs> Laura, you've seen so many in Robert iterations, <laughs> um, particularly the last segment, the reimagine. Is it just in that conversation I was having with Ben, it just hit me that this is where that needs to be dealt with. I need to explicitly revisit that statement in the reimagine section at the very end. If, if I um, could jump in, um, yeah. Ben, ben, I really appreciated that you found that sentence challenging or challenge worthy because after watching the film the other night, it hit me again that that's just not quite right yet. Yeah. And, and it's in my very short list of things, whereas I think Reimagine is phenomenally strong now and, and really gives us gravitas, but hope at the same yeah. time. And I think we need both. Um, but that sentence actually sparked a conversation in our household. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it maybe in our next iteration, we'll, we'll grapple with that yet again. Um, because it's... And, and I I, uh, I remember early on, just a, a few minutes ago, um, Ben, you mentioned something about the indigenous point of view or the indigenous mindset about water as being a, a gift. I'm not exactly, I can't remember how you phrase it, but it really a, a gift from from the world and from, from, from the gods. Um, and Rob, you talk in Reimagine about a certain kind of mindset that we need to find as a, as a society uh, to be able to move forward. Well, what a wonderful mindset to adopt that this is a gift that we have. We really need to appreciate it and treat it as such and not treat it so casually or as if it's ever renewable. Yeah, I, I do just have to say that that idea comes straight from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is this incredible plant ecologist and uh, indigenous woman, uh, Potawatomi Indian, who, um, who, who reframes the scientific term as an ecosystem service, which really is so focused on the economy and survival. And, and a gift, of course, first of all, implies gratitude. But second of all, there's a, a responsibility there, right? There's a relationship there. And I, I really do love that choice of, of descriptor. Yeah. And, and I think, again, to your point, Ben, and back to your specific words in your talk, Rob, it came up in the post-show conversation the other night that we, particularly in the post-industrial technologically uh, driven age that we live in, our first response often to saving the planet is what do we have to sacrifice? And, and I pose the thought that maybe we need to think about what it is that we need to offer. Hmm to sustain us better rather than think of it as a sacrifice. And that that includes us yeah. as opposed to puts us in opposition to the thing that we're, <laughs> we're actually trying to save. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that, that these kinds of refinements in language, I mean, it's been, how many years have been, we've been working on this? I mean, in a way, I'm lucky. My job's done. <laughs> but, but, but the quartet, I have to say, your playing gets deeper and better and more beautiful with each performance. I was knocked out. It was phenomenally, awesomely beautiful. And so your job is never done either. Um, but the images and the words, I think, are going to never be done because I think this, mm. this is an ongoing conversation that we have with our planet. And with ourselves as human beings on it. Uh, well, indeed, and the the thing that's changed the most in in the script over eight years, Laura, uh, is is the ending, and part of that's just because it's that's the hardest bit. Where where do you leave the audience? Sure. Um, but the other part of it is that the over eight years the audience has changed, uh, has evolved mm -hmm. in their understanding of these topics, um, and so. Um, if you'll remember, the very first performance had a really hard-hitting ending. <laughs> Do you remember the machine? The machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I won't go into it for our audience here. Let's just say that it uh, it was it was pretty heavy. But at the and we had we all we had conversations about that and felt that it was just necessary. Um, but at, about five years ago, I think we had another conversation. Said, you know, we don't think that's necessary anymore. Mm 
And so yeah. we took it out. And I think that was the right decision. Um, so yeah. I think this is going to continue to evolve and change as what's happening changes and as people's understanding changes. So. That's certainly already been the case with the project. Um, the the public view, especially here in Utah, but really across the, the country uh, in 2012, um, just the, the public awareness and relationship to the topic was totally different. And of, of course, also the science was different. What we knew then is different than what we know now. And so both of those have had uh, a big impact on on, on how the, the project has evolved. And as you say, we'll continue to do so. Neither of those things are static. So I, we're wondering, um, uh, I guess we're, we're coming up to the end of our time, and I just wanted to maybe uh, throw it open uh, to both of you. Maybe we'll start with Ben uh, and and say, oh, and just anything that you've, that struck you about the performance or about these issues or even things that it raised in your mind as we're going that, that you haven't had a chance to art articulate just yet. Uh, well, I love the way that Laura mentioned the 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 musical and artistic side. At some level, is is more done, and it's. I just found the the music so moving, and the combination of visuals and music, and even the the science in an artistic way. Right? I mean, you have the shape of the curves that you show, but also the the importance of those numbers. And for me, it brought me closer to. That goal, you know, when when we can really think deeply about these global numbers, you can feel a sense of community with the people all around the world. It no longer is 1.8 million people; it's all the billions of people that are working together. Uh, we can we can choose to live differently. That it was it was extremely moving to me, and the flip side of the the ramping, accelerating consumption is that there are so many good things that are also growing exponentially. And so it's sometimes can be very dis, um, uh, very, I just forgot the word, but uh, not disconcerting, but um, discouraging. There we are. It can be very discouraging when you see all of kind of the dashboard of the world and the, the list of all the problems. But there also are really, really good indicators of, of how we're changing, including decreasing water footprints on a per capita and overall basis. So we're able to have more people have the food they need with less water. And, and that, that's a change that's already going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of sewage that's being dumped into our waterways is uh, plummeting, going down. So there, there are these good things that take a while to get momentum, but really are moving forward. So that's, I, I thought that you hit the final tone of the film spot on for me. It actually aligns uh, with me personally and is motivating, but it also aligns with what I see uh, from a scientific view of the status of the system. We certainly can't be complacent, but we should not be despondent. Well said. Laura. Oh dear, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say at this point. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this. You've, you've seen the performance many times, but but now it's finally on film. Anything that struck you uh, as as interesting or unique or I don't know how did it it's a different way to view it I, I actually one of the things I loved about the film was the way in which the members of the quartet became active as actors with the close-ups speaking that was really theatrical and dramatic that was never been quite being able to be achieved when they're sitting in their seats with their stands in in performance this was much more stark and powerful and it it actually deepened for me that we're all in this together like they're making this beautiful music with this incredible skill and c communication amongst themselves to express the the behind everything that you're talking about but then they're just people waking up and looking at the audience and that was that was particularly cinematic that was different than in a live theater. Um, I actually started spinning out to, okay, now there's the movie movie, not just the filmed performance that's more filmic than live performance because I can see even more potential. Um, so I, I was thrilled. I mean, Rebecca, who's the visual artist, full disclosure, and is my wife um, of many of the paintings that were used. We're just and jumping who, up and down. 
<laughs> and who we will we will feature in our next podcast, actually. Right, yes. and 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 like you, her career has changed as a result in some way of this project because she's now working as a sustainable landscape designer. So, but 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 we were just ecstatic with with where we've gone on this, where you've taken this into its next level, and selfishly, it made me want to write another quartet for the incredible Fry Street Quartet, which I wanted to do for so long, but hearing them again was like oh, just a love affair all over again. So that, those are my takeaways, aside from all the important messaging of the piece. Wow. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. And I, I know, Robert, um, you, maybe you will take us out of here. Yes, and thank you for, for that, Laura. We would so welcome the chance to, to wor uh, work with you yet again on an, another project and uh, keep our fingers crossed for that. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us. This has really been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, before we go, uh, we'd like to let you know that you can donate uh, if you enjoyed this program and others similar to it. You can donate to the Nova Chamber Music Society that is helping us present this. Uh, you can donate at www.novaslc.org which is also the same um, website where you can find the premiere of the, the film, as well as more podcast episodes like this, www.novaslc.org slash crossroads. We'd like to um, thank our sponsors, um, which are Nova's season sponsors are the Utah Legislature, the Utah Divisions of Arts and Museums, the Lawrence T. and Janet T. D. Foundation, the Salt Lake County Zoo and Arts, Arts and Parks, George S. and Delora Dora Eccles Foundation, Isotope, Salt Lake City Arts Council, the Cultural Vision Fund, Dominion Energy, Rocky Mountain Power Foundation, Alice M. Distant Fund of Columbia University, and the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music. Laura, Ben, thank you so much. And Rob is my co-host, thank you always. Uh, and thank you to all of us for joining, um, and we hope that we'll see you again for our next episode. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.